What does the word moirang mean to you? What is it? I haven't heard about it. Nothing. Shayad rangon ke baare mein kuch hoga. Koi jagah ka naam ho sakta hai. Northeast ka koi festival? Moirang is a town. Yes. Moirang is a sleepy little town in Manipur, 45 kilometers from Imphal. Moirang is also a testament to one man's audacious dream. Moirang is where a flag of free India was first hoisted on liberated Indian soil by the Indian National Army or Azad Hind Fauj after beating back the British Indian Army on the 14th of April 1944. In 2019, All India Radio travels to Moirang to tell the story of a forgotten victory. It is 14th of April, New Year's Day here. But the offerings laid out at a small temple-like structure called Moirang Kangla are not for any New Year puja. This is a sacred place called Moirang Kangla. So uh, historically it's important. This was the place where the kings of Moirang used to be coronated here because Moirang was once a kingdom. Mrinashri Mairembam, an official of the Arts and Culture Department Manipur government, is telling us about the sanctity of the temple-like structure. Next to the structure is a flagpole. Tourists, staff of the Arts and Culture Department, Personnel of the 42 Assam Rifles Battalion take up their positions near the flagpole. Good! Come on! A tricolor goes up, raised by the King of Moirang, Lai Prakpam Ibohal Singh. The crowd breaks into spontaneous cries of Jai Hind. some sing the national anthem the flag has three bands yellow white and green with the image of a springing tiger in the middle one such flag was planted at the very same spot in 1944 by colonel shokat ali malik of the bahadur group of the ina the indian national army they had fought extremely well in the bishanpur sector and were the first to capture any territory by indo japan forces within the indian mainland since operations began in the arakan front in february 1944 sanjeev singh of moirang recalls at that time my grandfather was the local leader cm koiring singh then the koiring along with the four person prakam sanaba mainam mani kumam kangren went to meet the colonel sokot ali malik then the colonel sokot ali proposed that they want to hoist it a flag as a mark of the liberation actually this kangla is the sacred place of ancient moirang so it will be a historical landmark if they hoisted this flag for the first time on this kangla the flag was hoisted in a ceremonial manner afterwards colonel malik addressed the 50 odd people gathered at moirang kangla and we quote on 23rd october 1943 the provisional government of azad hind declared war on england and america the indian national army with unstinted support of the japanese government has now crossed the indo burmese border in the course of its struggle for liberation of the people of india from the british yoke we have now reached moirang the ancient citadel of manipur our commitment is to march to delhi and unfurl the tricolor flag there at the lal kila many have died on our way to reach here and many more will die on our way to reach delhi so dear friends give your hands your collective efforts to free india from this slavery 
Moirang gave happily to the Indo-Japanese war cause. Rations, donations, livestock, volunteers. Local leaders and volunteers like K. Kang Leng Singh donated 80 mounds of rice and 40 mounds of dry fish to the Indo-Japanese forces at the very first instance. Some Manipuri freedom fighters who were present, active members of the Nikhil Manipuri Mahasabha, had spent a sleepless night watching from under the Lamkhai Bridge, the withdrawal of the 17th Division of the British Army towards Bishnupur. The freedom fighters, including Mairembam Koireng Singh, declared their support for the INA. Hemam Nilamani Singh's house was to serve as the first headquarters of the INA in Free India. Hemam Nilamani Singh's daughter, Priyoshaki Devi, shares her memories of those stirring times when her family opened up their home and hearth for the INA. In that house, along with my mother and my aunt and all, some of the Japanese army also stayed together. My mother used to cook for them. My father, he collected from Paddy Warriors, collected the grains and everything has been supplied for the army. Even it is not sufficient, he collected from his relatives and his friends and it is the food was supplied to the Indian National Army. Hemam Nilamani Singh's house was located conveniently half a kilometre from the strategic Tidim Road linking Imphal to Tidim in Burma. It was also close to the Loktak Lake, whose swamps and floating biomass provided useful hideouts apart from the dense jungles in the nearby hill ranges. Captain Naki Ahmad Chaudhary, a Manipuri, had come down from Burma with Colonel Shokat Malik's Bahadur group. Major Pujewaraga. After a thorough discussion between Major Fuziwara and Colonel Sokot Ali Malik, I was sent down with a patrolling party to study the situation in the valley. And I realized that Moirang was the perfect place for hoisting the flag and setting up temporary INA headquarters. So I planted a flag to mark the spot for the proposed headquarters. This was sometime in mid-March 1944. My commanding officer, Sokat Ali Malik, took a great interest once the reports of the reconnaissance team reached him. He personally came to the area. I acted as a guide for him. Malik Saab acknowledged the fact that it was the most suitable location for our logistical requirements, after which Moirang became the headquarters of the INA for some time. Naki Ahmad Chaudhary was a young man looking for a job in Imphal when he heard of the war in faraway Europe. The year was 1941. The political agent in Manipur took out a notice for volunteers to join the British Indian Army. That October, Naki Ahmed found himself on a ship bound for Singapore from Bombay after enlisting in the army at Jorhat. He was posted in Kota Bharu. When the Japanese invasion of Malaya began just after midnight on the 8th of December 1941. just before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Singapore fell to the Japanese on the 15th of February, 1942. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. With this archival recording of All India Radio, we travel in time to the historic Farrar Park in Singapore with Naki Ahmed, one of the 40,000 surrendered Indian troops of the British Indian Army assembled here two days after the fall of Singapore. British Army se Japan ka mayo na bungam dar tuna 1942 ki February 15 da unconditional surrender tau kiramie. At Ferrer Park, a treaty was signed between the British Army and the Japanese Army. 
Colonel Hunt, representing the British Army, formally handed over the surrendered troops to Major Fujiwara, who represented the Japanese Army. Major Fujiwara addressed us, the Indians of the British Army, over the microphone. He said that Japan desired to fight the British and liberate India, that we would not be taken as prisoners of war and we could join Captain Mohan Singh, who would be forming an army for the liberation of India, the INA. I was selected for the intelligence wing of the INA. There were various units in the INA, but I was given special charge in the intelligence unit under Mohan Singh as his assistant. The Second World War reached Imphal with the first aerial bombing by Japan in May 1942. And this remote northeastern frontier of British India was suddenly catapulted into the pages of military history. It turned into a massive battlefield in 1944, when the Imperial Japanese Army, together with the INA units, launched Operation U Go, with its main objective of capturing Imphal from the British Indian Army. Some of the fiercest battles in military history took place on the hills and villages surrounding the valley of Imphal. Jungle-topped hills burnt bare from the shell fire. The onset of the monsoon turned the battlefield into a muddy morass of indescribable horror and ugliness. Years later, in 2013, the battles of Imphal and Kohima would together be named Britain's greatest battle by UK's National Army Museum. From across the border in Burma, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose had made his clarion call to his INA soldiers to join that battle. There, there in the distance, beyond that river, beyond those jungles, beyond those hills, lies the promised land, the soil from which we sprang, the land to which we shall now return. Hark, India is calling. India's metropolis Delhi is calling. 388 millions of our countrymen are calling. Blood is calling to blood. Get up. We have no time to lose. Take up your arms. There in front of you is the road that our pioneers have built. We shall march along the road. We shall carve our way through the enemy's ranks. Or if God wills, we shall die a martyr's death. And in our last sleep, we shall kiss the road that will bring our army to Delhi. The road to Delhi is the road to freedom. Chalo! With the Chalo Delhi slogan reverberating in the hills and jungles of Burma, on the 18th of March 1944, the INA soldiers crossed over onto Indian soil the hills surrounding Imphal. In his memoir, titled Defeat into Victory, General William J. Slim, commander of the British 14th Army, writes, Quote, Like unevenly spaced spokes of a wheel, six routes converge onto the Imphal plain to meet at the hub, Imphal itself. It was by these that the Japanese and INA strove to break into the plain. The fighting all around its circumference was continuous, fierce, and often confused, as each side maneuvered to outwit and kill. And what were the responses of the local Manipuris to the war that they were dragged into? Dr. H. Sudhir Kumar, who teaches history at Manipur University, tells us that Netaji's messages had a tremendous influence on a section of the Manipuri intelligentsia, especially the Nikhil Manipur Mahasabha, and Praja Samilani. The Manipuris, both from the hills as well as from the valleys, had participated in the INA movement. May not be necessarily as a competent force, but in terms of rendering physical support, moral support, 
and even for their financial support. In spite of the strong military propaganda propagated by Allied forces under the British force. The Allied force, the British force had come up with a strong stringent policy of punishing all those who are directly or indirectly associated with the combined Japanese Imperial Force and the INA. There are stories galore of the love and support the INA enjoyed from the hill tribes of Manipur. Dr. Krishna Bose, eminent Netaji researcher, tells us one. I met somebody there at Churachandpur. Mm. I was told that Netaji had come up to Churachandpur, a village there. So we went there and asked, is there anyone who saw him at that time? They said, yes, there is the Raja, the Raja of Saikot, a village. Raja meaning you know, chief at that time. So the chief, we did meet, he came. And his name was Colbell, he said. And he said that he took us to a place and said, look, this is the Dumur tree. Netaji sat under this tree. He had come to see there was a camp of the Azad Hind, some of the Azad Hind sepoys there. He had come to meet them. So the sepoys all came and sat. It was a wonderful moonlit night. I gave tea to the soldiers and I gave a glass of milk to Netaji. And Netaji said, I only take what my men take. I do not take anything else. But I told him, sir, this is our custom that if we have an honored guest, we offer him milk. Then Netaji said, if it is your custom, all right. I will take it, and he took it. And he said, he spoke to him and said that, I have heard that you people have helped my soldiers very much. We will remember it when India is free. And he even wrote something in a paper and gave him that and said, keep it carefully, but don't let the British see it. So when the British took over, he put it in a trunk and he said that later... Water had seeped in, and I have lost that thing also. But this was a wonderful meeting with a man. You see, as a researcher, we always do cross-checking. Who is saying what? And there are many stories in Nagaland also like this, that he had come in. But this thing, at least somebody was telling directly to me that I did meet him, and I, this was... And it sounded really could be true. He would come in for a short while, maybe inspect the sepoys and then go out. So that was a wonderful experience. Imphal-based Rajeshwar Yumnam is President Second World War Imphal Campaign Foundation. He calls himself a war enthusiast and has many a war anecdote to share. Like how the INA regimental commander Colonel I.J. Kiani had once sent his men uphill in a surprise attack. The weather was unusually bitter and the INA soldiers had no warm clothes to protect them from the biting cold. Lieutenant Mansuklal was ordered to recapture one of the heights and he was commanding a platoon consisting of approximately 30 men. With this small force, he counterattacked without any artillery covering fire and recaptured one of the strongest posts occupied by the British. While leading his small and semi staff force up the steep bridge, he was wounded 13 times. Through exhaustion and loss of blood, he staggered and fell to the ground. His men, seeing their gallant commander fall, hesitated and slowed down their pace. But Lieutenant Mansuklal, like a tiger that is mortally wounded but is determined to make the last charge, roared to his men and exhorted them to continue their advance and not to worry about him. Hindi Sipahi, Hindi Sipahi, Rakhna hai tujhe Hind mein buniyad hai aman ki. Netaji was confident of winning the Imphal campaign. But history records how the monsoons came a month too early that year, turning roads into slush, cutting off his supply lines. Still, his men held the enemy in Arakan and Hakka and had advanced in Kaladan, Tidim, Palel and Kohima. They held on through April, May, 
June. But in July, when monsoon came, and you know the supply line was cut off. Dr. Krishna Bose, educationist, parliamentarian, and chairperson, Netaji Research Bureau. They had no air force. On the other hand, the Americans had come, and food was being dropped on the other side, and these people were fighting. I have met sepoys even who said they were fighting. They were eating grass, boiled grass, and they had their mosquito net and fished a little bit of fish, and that would be wonderful. They say the grass and fish together. So, but that was not the nutritious food for an army at all. So, at last, the order came to retreat, and we know that they did not want to retreat at that time. But there was no way else, you know. So there was the Imphal retreat, was also very terrible retreat. The Manipuris who were involved with the INA were part of that long traumatic retreat by foot, through what William Slim has described as some of the world's worst countryside, breeding the world's worst diseases, and having for half the year the world's worst climate. Tampaklema Devi of Moirang, a retired assistant director of public instruction, remembers. They left Moirang on 20th July 1944, the army of INA. Yes. And on the way they uh, went by foot, they went to Burma. But on the way, one of the oldest freedom fighters, Shri Kiam Gopal, she died. But uh, his sanskar was doing on the bank of the river Minitia and the by give saluting by the Indian National Army. They arrived in the camp of Injung, inside Burma. And then they arrived the head office of Rangoon on 16 September 1944. Okay. And then Ice Nilamani Singh met Netaji Shabash and the boss. And then he handed over rupees 3,000 to Netaji. Then Netaji Shobhasandha was very happy. And then they kept the group of Indian National Army coming from Manipur. He kept in different sections. Priyoshaki Devi remembers her father Hemam Nilamani Singh's meeting with Netaji in Burma. He saw Netaji in a petty field in a moonlit night. He was very told. When my father was uh, 5'10", but Netaji is above 6. When he saw the Netaji, when Netaji speaks something, he feels like that he can tear the British people. The Imphal campaign has gone down in history as a disaster and a debacle for the INA and Japanese forces. However, there is another way of looking at it, feels Sumantra Bose, Professor of International and Comparative Politics at the London School of Economics and Netaji's grand nephew. In early July 1943, Netaji arrived in Singapore. Within three months, he was able to revive the INA, to mobilize the diaspora population, and was able to declare the provisional government of Free India on the 21st October 1943. Of course, the next logical step was to acquire territory for this provisional government to administer, even if it happened to be only a tiny sliver of the vast subcontinent. And within six months, literally, of the declaration of the provisional government of Free India, the Arsi Hukumati Azad Hind, uh, in Singapore, the INA is able to raise the national flag in northeastern India. It's quite remarkable that for another three to four months until July, the INA forces with relatively limited weapons, with extremely overstretched you know, supply lines in difficult terrain, are able to hold on in that sliver of India which they had liberated. <laughs> The famous trial of INA soldiers at the Red Fort and the resultant mutiny by the Royal Indian Navy and widespread civilian protests 
acted as a catalyst in hastening the independence of India. And not just India, believes Dr. Krishna Bose, chairperson, Netaji Research Bureau. It was not only a catalyst for independence of India, I talk about the subcontinent of India of that time, but it was a catalyst for Asia as well. As soon as India became free, all the other Asian colonies, all one after the other, became free. Could be from the French or from the Portuguese, from others, not only the British. But so it was a catalyst, you can say, for the independence of Asia. Netaji was prophetic about this and had affirmed in his final call to the INA in 1944. Friends, I do not know how many of us who are going to participate in the coming battles will survive to see India free. But whether we survive or not, whether we individually live to see India free or not, we are confident that India shall be free. We are confident that Anglo-American imperialism will be wiped out of India. We are confident that the menace that now hangs over East Asia will be removed once for all. There were other flags unfurled at Moirang and Bijaya Yum Lembam, a producer with All India Radio's Imphal station, has memories of one from October 1993 when the INA was observing the golden jubilee of its formation. Then, a young production assistant, Bijaya Yum Lembam, was sent on OB coverage duty to Moirang. It was a very chilly morning. I had to wear my overcoat and I went there. We have the INA Museum in Moirang. In front of that, there was a huge ground. It's no more there now. Many buses came. And in those buses, I saw ex-INA coming from all over the country. And looking at them, some of them were not wearing even a shawl, you know. It was so cold and they are wearing Rajasthani turban. So I look at the turbans and I know they're there from Rajasthan. And with their big moustache and some of them got beard. And they were all very old at that time. And they were wearing dhotis and chapels. Then when they reached the ground, when they all of them gathered together, then one girl from Moirang, she was one of our radio artists only. She was uh, going to present uh, the INA song of Kadam Kadam Barayaja. Just then, the old, the old INA people, they assembled. Then, when the INA flag was unfurled, and this girl started singing that song, all of them, they saluted the flag, and they were crying. They were having tears in their eyes, and uh, I could not help myself being moved by that, you know. I think there was not even a single person in that gathering who didn't have a wet eye. Dr. H. Sudhir Kumar of the Department of History, Manipur University, finds it distressing that an important segment in our struggle for independence, the INA history, and particularly its Northeast chapter, languishes today in just footnotes. The history of INA movement occupies a very central position in the entire history of Indian freedom struggle. But interestingly, what happened is that this chapter has not been given a proper attention in the existing and the dominant historical scholarship. Even so, what happened is that if we go for opening the pages of some of the authority history textbooks, which are recommended for uh, graduates and even for their undergraduates, you will not find this chapter on INA movement. Yes, there are some books on which we can find the chapters on INA movement. But it is very incomplete. Somebody will be confused that they will not have a clear picture about the INA movement. So my feeling is that this chapter has not been given a due uh, the recognition in the existing historical scholarship. And I strongly feel that this very historic chapter should be properly studied and should become very important component of the historical scholarship. In 1949, Jawaharlal Nehru had appointed noted historian Pratul Chandra Gupta to author a book on the military operation conducted by the INA 
in the Northeast. After extensive research, Gupta had produced a 490-page manuscript titled INA in Military Operation. In 2011, Professor Purabi Roy, historian and one of the foremost Netaji researchers, was allowed limited access to the manuscript at the Ministry of Defence's Record Division in New Delhi. She has a very clear recollection of reading about the Imphal campaign where two units of the INA are diverging, fully confident of winning and coming together again. The way they have been organized, give the command, and the way they have been divided to two lines, one going to Manipur and the other going to Nagaland, this is something very organized men have done. And day to day, how they were got the training, and day to day, how they were arranging the march, that they will be divided there, and their parting speeches. When they parted, both of them greeted, both the lines, they greeted each other and said that we will come with victory. That was there. And I remember why, you know, because they were telling Zarur. And uh, anyway, that is the most significant part. I remember and all the time I recall it. The house of Nilamani Singh still stands in Moirang. Its bullet riddled tin roof and cracked clay reed walls, a mute witness to many a story. A faded board on one wall still displays the springing tiger and the INA motto of unity, faith and sacrifice. Sitting in the warm brown courtyard of the house, Hemam Nilamani Singh's niece, Tampaklema Devi, makes a fervent plea for the preservation and protection of the house built in the 30s, the only Azad Hind headquarters in India. This is the sacred soil of the Indian National Army. They spend here three months. Why they don't take care of this house? I don't know. I would like to keep very nicely for memory to develop, to take care of this house. The complex where the INA flag flies in Moirang is called the INA Martyrs Memorial Complex. Housed inside is the INA War Museum, which transports us back to those tumultuous Second World War days. Apart from battle memorabilia, we see stamps of the provisional government of Azad Hind and currency of the Azad Hind Bank, indicative of Netaji's administrative vision for liberated territories. In a picture gallery dedicated to Manipuri freedom fighters, we learn of two ladies, Kena Devi and Randoni Devi, who had enlisted in the Rani Jhansi Regiment of the INA. Rinashri Mairembam, the assistant curator of the INA War Museum. It took long time to build the whole thing since it was done by a small committee which was headed by our late uh, grandfather, Mr. Koiring Singh, under his leadership. There were a few people, Mr. Hemam Nilamani Singh, even including my father, Manindra Singh, my Rimbam. The real initiative was started in 1955 onwards and with the contribution from the people, local people, as well as the West Bengal government started donating by a sum of rupees 50,000. That was a huge sum during that time and they started building the Netaji library. Finally, the whole construction was done, finished in 1969. Before leaving Singapore finally, Netaji had one dear wish that a memorial would be built on the sea face of Singapore to commemorate the unknown warrior of the INA. An edifice came up in record time, bearing the motto of the INA, Itmat, Ittafak, Kurbani, Faith, Unity, Sacrifice. When the British returned to Singapore, Lord Louis Mountbatten, head of the Southeast Asia Command of the British, ordered the INA memorial to be destroyed. 
A replica of that destroyed monument stands proud in the INA Martyrs Memorial Complex at Moirang. A silent witness to the sacrifice of the thousands who fell and kissed the ground around here. Bird song has long replaced the chatter of guns in this little town, which had once kept its tryst with the history books. Now, Moirang keeps vigil on the memories of a little-known saga, of an audacious dream, in resonance with Netaji's belief that in this mortal world, everything perishes and will perish, but ideas, ideals, and dreams do not. <laughs>